If you know your history, you know that nationalism that has become extreme resulted in horrible things. The erosion of democracy and civil liberties, authoritarianism, Christian nationalism teaches it would be better if Christians seized positions in government and the, the culture the and then forced our values on the rest of the world. Nationalism but nowhere do we see my the biggest issue with Christian nationalism, nationalism is that the fear of it seems to take Satan tempted Christian, Christian values are in the weapon mission to the Christian to not get the gospel, to not use the word of the gospel, to use Christian ideas. The famous Christian apologist behind inspiring philosophy by the name of Michael Jones has relatively recently posted a string of content against Christian nationalism, culminating in his latest video on the matter, Why I Am Not a Christian Nationalist. As one who affirms Christian nationalism, rightly understood, I was greatly interested in seeing a Christian apologist as large as Jones suddenly enter the ring of the Christian nationalist debate. Needless to say, as some may already know from public comments of mine, I was very, very disappointed by his criticisms. Now, as tempted as I am to seriously rip into his errors, I won't be making too many jabs towards Michael himself, because one, this isn't anything personal, not at all. Um, but also due to the fact that he played a major role during a crisis of faith that I had in the year of 2017, particularly his material on the resurrection and the authorship of the Gospels. So, Michael, if you're watching this, and I mean this with complete sincerity, you have my thanks and my eternal gratitude. And please unblock me on Twitter. With that said, I'm still going to be quite straightforward and at times a little bit cheeky with my response. To this end, I will be chiefly reliant on four videos where Michael lays out his arguments. First, his video, Why I'm Not a Christian Nationalist, as mentioned before, which will be the primary foil of this response, as it appears to be Michael's main response material published on this issue. Second, his interview with Andrew Whitehead, which displays some of the key influences behind Michael's understanding and critiques of Christian nationalism. Third, his older video, Does Christianity Cause Christian Nationalism? And fourth, his more recent interview with our mutual friend Gideon Lazar, or the Byzantine Scotus, in which Gideon, who is more sympathetic to Christian nationalism, though does not identify as such himself, offers some pushback to Michael's main arguments on the issue. It was a good discussion, and I recommend others give it a watch. I may also consider other material from Jones that I find relevant to this response, though this may or may not be the case with the end product since at the time of writing this paragraph, which I'm speaking out loud right now, I'm barely halfway through research and script writing. This response will also be systematic, dealing with the problems of his arguments in a structured fashion rather than just trudging through his videos in chronological order. I ultimately hope that this response will better inform critics of Christian nationalist thought like Michael Jones and, God willing, see even see them to come to agreement with it. Again, rightly understood. With that said, let's get to it. We will start by considering Michael's arguments in summary form. This part was quite tricky for me because he never really provides anything like a precise, systematic critique. Most of his arguments amount to, to be respectful, little more than moral and biblical sloganeering, and that's me putting it as respectfully as possible without downplaying the error. This much will be demonstrated throughout the response in this video, but for now, here's my best attempts to summarize Michael's argument. Argument 1, the role of government. Point 1. The purpose of government is the protection of life, liberty, and the property of individuals. This includes the protection of freedom of religion, speech, and expression. Point 2. The role of the state does not include making a people more moral, and nor is it capable of doing so. Point 3. Christian nationalism aims to enforce Christianity and a particular expression thereof by force upon the people, and this is wrong. 
because such was never commanded by Christ and because the example he set in his ministry demonstrates a contrary approach to be explicated in the next set of arguments. Argument two, the example of Christ and the duty of Christians. Point one, Christ's mission was fundamentally an act of humility, giving up power for the sake of man's salvation. Point two, Christians are to follow in his example by means of spreading the gospel through humility and persuasion, not the seizing of power. Argument three, the harms of Christian nationalism. Point one, Christian nationalism is strongly tied to authoritarian and ethnocentric views and tendencies. Point two, authoritarian and ethnocentric views are bad because... Um, uh, point three, therefore, Christian nationalism is demonstrably unchristian, as demonstrated by its fruits. Now, I encourage everyone watching this to also at least watch the videos by Jones listed here and linked in the description below, which will be especially helpful in the very unlikely scenario that I have strawmanned his argument at some point. With the basic critique established, we will now weigh Jones' arguments and his specific evidences on the grounds of their logical integrity, factual veracity, and by the tripartite standard of scripture, tradition, and reason as understood in Anglicanism and is so far as each of those three points are relevant to the argument, which they may or may not be. Again, I wrote this bit before most of the script and research was done. To summarize this principle, here is Richard Hooker, one of the most foundational theologians of the whole Anglican tradition. What scripture doth plainly deliver, to that the first place both of credit and obedience is due. The next whereunto is whatsoever any man can necessarily conclude by force of reason. After these, the voice of the church succeedeth. That which the church by her ecclesiastical authority shall probably think and define to be true or good must, in congruity of reason, overrule all other inferior judgments whatsoever. With this said, let's begin. The first issue that must obviously be addressed is discerning just what Christian nationalism actually means, both as a concept and as Michael understands it, so that we may know what the object of critique actually is. This question also happens to be where the first problem with Michael Jones's critique comes in, because at no point in his videos I have seen on the issue does he provide a definition from a major intellectual proponent of Christian nationalism itself, but instead relies on the work of hostile sociologists. In fact, he effectively admits this in his relatively recent interview with the Byzantine SCOTUS. What my understanding of Christian nationalism is going to be the, the way it's typically defined in sociological research. So that's where I was first introduced to Christian nationalism, was reading sociolo sociological research, working with a sociologist I know named Kenneth Vaughn. Now, an individual being hostile to an idea does not entail that he cannot accurately define it. If that were the case, any and all rational discourse would be impossible. But I point this out in order to highlight that if Michael's public citations are any indication, he has done at best very little, if not no actual reading in Christian nationalist writings himself, at least when he made his own set of videos, although he does speak as though he has read at least some of Dr. Stephen Wolfe's The Case for Christian Nationalism in the Gideon Lazar interview, which postdates his own videos. Further, these sociologists he relies upon are providing their own definitions grounded on their observations of social phenomena, whereas multiple thinkers behind Christian nationalism define it and justify it on the grounds of principle, which is a completely different question. As a result, the definition Jones does provide is fundamentally derived from observing an alleged ideological trend or movement that is subject to change, rather than analyzing a principled argument or framework, which in turn causes a number of errors in his argument later on. To correct this problem, I will be evaluating his characterizations of Christian nationalism according to two of the most important standards published by contemporary Christian nationalists. First, the Case for Christian Nationalism by Dr. Stephen Wolfe, and second, the Statement on Christian Nationalism and the Gospel, authored by James Silberman and Dusty Devers, with contributions by William Wolfe, Joel Webin, Jeff Wright, and Corey Anderson. You can find the link to this statement in the description below. 
With that said, the definition that Jones does provide comes from his older May of 2022 video, Does Christianity Cause Christian Nationalism? Wherein he states, Christian nationalism, or civilizationism, generally is understood to mean that Christian values and doctrines should have power over the state and culture. The nation and culture should be defined by aspects within Christianity, and the government should be active in enforcing this. Through things like having Christian symbols in public spaces, laws based on values found in Christianity, or forcing children to pray in schools. Immigration is also discouraged, as one doesn't want outsiders to come in, bringing in their own cultural values and altering the Christian nation from within. To quote from one paper, Christian nationalism is described as a cultural framework concerned with national heritage, boundary drawing, social order, embattlement and conquest. But more recently, he asked for a definition by Dr. Andrew Whitehead, the author of American Idolatry, during their live interview, and with which Michael seemed to concur. Andrew gives the following definition. You know, over the years and, and through various studies, you know, we've come to define Christian nationalism as a cultural framework that advocates for a particular expression of Christianity to be fused with American civic life and, and privileged in the public sphere. Um, and it you know, desires that the government should vigorously uh, promote and preserve this expression of Christianity um, as the, the undisputed cultural framework guiding life in America. Michael and Andrew both provide their own somewhat clear definitions of Christian nationalism, but which also have great deficiencies that inevitably lead to critical straw men of the concept, even when Jones directly appealed to Wolf's book in the interview with Gideon Lazar. The most egregious example of an error is when Andrew Whitehead claims that Christian nationalism calls for a particular expression of Christianity to be fused with American civic life. On the level of principle, this is actually not true. While there are Christian nationalists, including myself, who would like to see their own tradition become the dominant expression of the faith in a Christian nation, others are content with a more general standard of Christianity that tolerates the coexistence of multiple traditions and denominations, that is, multiple expressions of Christianity. In fact, even I, an Anglican supremacist, would be fine with a Christian nation that tolerates multiple generally orthodox traditions, even if I'd preferred Anglicanism to become the undisputed norm. As it should. In fact, Article 2 of the Statement on Christian Nationalism and the Gospel explicitly denies that, quote, a Christian nation must require or preclude membership in any particular confessional tradition or denomination. Remember, Whitehead didn't just say Christian nationalists could wish for the establishment of an official denomination. He rather claimed that Christian nationalism, by definition, that is, in its very substance, in its very nature, seeks to fuse American civic life with a particular expression of Christianity. And yet, this major statement on Christian nationalism by Christian nationalists, one of whom is incidentally now a state senator, as far as I'm aware, explicitly denies the necessity of this feature, thus rendering it a straw man of at least a major section of the Christian nationalist umbrella. As for Michael's definition, it's largely correct, but way too simply and polemically framed. It focuses almost exclusively on the power aspects of Christianity taking hold of a state, as opposed to the focus on grounding principles, especially those of natural law and not merely of special revelation. And from this, he makes a number of simplistic and bizarre claims about what Christian nationalists want. The nation and culture should be defined by aspects within Christianity and the government should be active in enforcing this. Through things like having Christian symbols in public spaces, laws based on values found in Christianity, or forcing children to pray in schools. Immigration is also discouraged, as one doesn't want outsiders to come in, bringing in their own cultural values and altering the Christian nation from within. So Christian nationalism wants public symbols and laws based on Christian values. It's more involved than that, but that is true enough. Forcing kids to pray in school, uh, what does he mean by forcing kids? Like mandating a public opening prayer in a classroom and just expecting the kids to bow their heads and close their eyes and that's it? Or holding the little atheist nerd kid in the back row at gunpoint? 
Um, excuse me, sir. Can I please go to the bathroom? Shut the frick up! Say Christ is Lord! <laughs> say Christ is Lord! <laughs> say it! You say Christ is Lord! He doesn't substantiate this point by demonstrating how a particular policy follows from Christian nationalist principles, just from the general vibe of the social phenomena labeled Christian nationalism as evidenced by overwhelming reliance on papers by sociologists. But even more egregious is that statement on immigration being discouraged because one doesn't want outsiders to come in, bringing in their own cultural values and so on. This one is just wild to me because principled Christian nationalism from the pens of Christian nationalist thinkers like Stephen Wolf don't say we don't want outsiders to come in simpliciter. The question is of who we let in, how many, and for what purpose. Stephen Wolf even speaks positively in principle about the concept of ethnogenesis, wherein multiple peoples come together, unite, and become a new composite nation. This demonstrates a core problem that shows itself across all of Michael's content on Christian nationalism, a lack of precision with terms, establishing definitions, and the ability to make distinctions. For the rest of this video, a much more accurate and widely applicable definition of Christian nationalism will be assumed, one provided for us by Dr. Wolf's The Case for Christian Nationalism, and his definition is as follows. Christian nationalism is a totality of national action consisting of civil laws and social customs conducted by a Christian nation as a Christian nation in order to procure for itself both earthly and heavenly good in Christ. I personally could not construct a better definition than this. Per Wolf's own explanation in the book, it simply explicates the basic combination of nation or nationalism and Christianity. As a result, we have a simple yet precise explanation of the core principles behind Christian nationalism, which may yet be applied by many different traditions. Something else that's also quite special about Dr. Wolf's book, and thus why I recommend it to everyone who wants to study this issue, is that he isn't promoting any novel, groundbreaking political theory, but simply explicating that of the classical reformers, and particularly the reformed theologians of the 16th to 17th centuries who in turn were a foundational influence on the original American political system. As such, Wolf is drawing on a historic, concrete understanding of Christian nationalism, rather than drawing an arbitrary circle around a desired target, which I unfortunately believe most opponents of Christian nationalism do in their polemics. <laughs> Having addressed the issue of definitions, we will now look at what I believe is the ultimate primordial flaw of Michael's whole case, and that is his lack of principled argumentation. By this I mean a lack of precise logical arguments, whether deductive or even inductive. Virtually his whole case is grounded upon vague concepts and slogans pit against one another, without much if any justification of why they are opposed or why his standalone assertions are even true. There are way too many examples of this throughout his videos to list, but here is one by way of demonstration. Jesus chose a path of suffering, but why? Because using political force will never transform humanity from a depraved, sinful race into a glorified race. The way we transform lives is through the message of the gospel, not forcing our values onto others. All must be willing to follow Christ, not be forced to. Christianity does not need worldly powers or institutions to grow. Our mission is a heavenly one, not an earthly one. The lie of Christian nationalism is that we need earthly powers to save the church. Our mission must first be political. Now, aside from the very poor argument of this clip and the major strawman, there really isn't any meaningful claim here, only a series of Jesus jukes. When one puts to the side the sermon-like language and passion of this clip and, and just looks at the argument, not only is it wrong, as will be shown later, but there is just much there to begin with at all. For example, why do, what does he mean by the church's mission being heavenly and not earthly? Does heavenly mean zero regard for temporal affairs before the eschaton? or just the telos of our mission? And what does he mean by forcing our values onto others? Isn't any law by definition forcing our values on others? More on that later. 
But undergirding all this is something of a radical Anabaptist conception of earthly versus heavenly realities. Why does Michael completely oppose the transformation of lives with state coercion on distinct matters? Christian nationalists are still Christian. Of course they, or we, believe in the primary work of the gospel. That is why we treat the roles of the church and the state as distinct, while yet being ordered towards the same ultimate good, just in different spheres. Jones does not address these principles with his own rigorously argued principles, just slogans about how this or that contradicts Christian nationalist claims without any demonstration of how that is the case. Take these two propositions side by side and think this through. How does this lead to this? It's a complete mystery, as far as I'm aware, because Michael doesn't provide us with logical steps that connect this proposition to this one. In other words, he doesn't make a syllogism. Now, this isn't to say that he doesn't make any arguments that need to be addressed in his videos. They are often just very vague and not grounded on precise propositions, which is a big problem and actually made prep for this video a lot harder than I expected. And in full fairness to Michael, the, the poor formulation of arguments filled with Jesus Jukes is not exceptional or special to his arguments on this issue in the anti-Christian nationalist camp. It's the norm. Despite all of this, Michael does try to give arguments and they need to be addressed. I just wanted to first highlight the overall problem that grounds the particular errors of his arguments so that you, the viewer, can more easily recognize such in your own investigations. With that said, we will now begin looking at some of his more specific arguments, but we can't be exhaustive given how much he's already said, uh, and nor is this video attempting to be a comprehensive defense of Christian nationalism, just a response to inspiring philosophy on what I believe is his, well, his, his ultimate methodological error as already discussed, but also some of the more key particular errors he makes in his videos, but not necessarily all of them. At multiple points in his videos, Michael makes complaints about Christian nationalism being authoritarian and threatening civil liberties. For example, If you know your history, you know that nationalism that has become extreme resulted in horrible things. The erosion of democracy and civil liberties, authoritarianism, and the death of millions. Research indicates Christianity, and specifically Protestant Christianity, leads to more civil liberties, education, literacy, and democracy and does not lead to more authoritarianism or extreme nationalism. But I do want to ask you this really quick, is yeah. that many people may, may agree with you that Christian nationalism can lead to authoritarianism. It can really, it just isn't really what the gospel teaches. But they may <laughs> say you're, you're sort of picking on the right. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of conservative Christians will argue that authoritarianism and anti-Christian ideas are bad, but they would say they're manifesting in very horrible ways on the left, for example. From what I've seen, he doesn't really make longer sustained arguments on this specific issue, but just makes a number of throwaway statements which are nonetheless revealing and are intended to be persuasive. In them, Michael reveals his underlying presuppositions that form a substantial part of his argument against Christian nationalism, yet which he never seeks to argue for, that being a universal right to political participation and equal rights in public religion. Things which are also clear in his tweets on the issue, a couple of which I cited beforehand. Michael Jones makes it clear that he believes Christian nationalists at least tend to deny these presuppositions, yet in his main videos on the matter, he doesn't seem to be at all aware of the arguments and principles raised by Christian nationalists against such presuppositions and for alternative foundations such as national self-determination, the state as a guardian of true public worship, and more. And he doesn't really even come to define authoritarianism or civil liberties either, because we as Christian nationalists, we could say, yes, we affirm civil liberties in a certain sense, and yes, we deny authoritarianism in a certain sense. Um, but assuming the worldview that Michael appears to take on, which appears to be something of a post-war consensus worldview, classical liberalism, quote unquote, um, given that, then yes, Christian nationalists, I would grant, would largely deny those ideas, those particular ideas of civil liberties and would not be phased by those broad ideas of authoritarianism. But 
to get back to the point, in presenting his presuppositions as just, it's just there, no need to elaborate further, Michael ironically acts as though his own political theory is just the undisputed teaching of scripture that Orthodox Christians everywhere take for granted. All that is needed to expose the immediate problem is to just shrug it off. Okay, we are authoritarian and don't believe in universal civil rights. And? When we withdraw to a wider perspective, Michael's political theory is simply not a given among all reasonable Orthodox Christians, and nor is it anything close to a scriptural teaching. Put simply, scripture never speaks of any absolute civil liberties for all kinds of residents, regardless of ethnicity, gender, or religion. And given Michael's biblicist standards of argumentation, that's all I need to say. But we can do more than that. The role of the state, per the explicit testimony of the New Testament, is to praise the good and punish evil. No demands are made in scripture, either explicitly or by good and necessary consequence, that the state ought to maintain equal civil rights of civic participation for all types of groups within its borders. Further, the state represents the collective will of a particular people, and so by nature it will and must represent that people's interests over that of foreign residents residing within its borders, or over that of people with opposing ideological or religious foundations. In principle, there is no obligation for the state to permit public opposition to the standing culture and religion, and there is every reason for it to actively suppress such activities, since maintaining the peace and interests of the nation, as well as honouring God, are the very roles of the state. Stephen Wolfe writes as much on this question. A Christian commonwealth is the civil regime of Christian nationalism. Christian nationalism, as I've argued, is a Christian nation acting for itself to secure, across generations, both its earthly and heavenly good. Achieving these goods requires civil government, an entity that explicitly and effectively acts upon society via civil law. Civil government is Christian not because it declares itself Christian, whether through pomp, titles, or constitutional preambles, but because it actually orders a Christian people to their complete good. This includes acting for the peace and good order of the instituted church, which administers the chief good. Thus, action, not declaration, makes a commonwealth Christian. The Christian prince should use his civil power to ensure the culture of his people reflects true religion. A Christian people will naturally produce this themselves if they have the proper will for their good. But the Christian prince orders, approves, and supplements it. Christian civil culture is an adornment of the temporal with the eternal. What I have in mind here are things and events that originate from life in this world but are adorned with something higher. In the domestic sphere, for example, the Christian family has not simply added Christian elements or replaced what is natural to the family, but has infused or invested or adorned natural family life with the Christian religion. Likewise, in the civil sphere, the Christian prince can Christianize civil life, not by replacing what is fundamentally particular and earthly in civil life, but by adorning and perfecting it with true religion. In other words, the state does have a role in forming the habits of a people, which in turn plays a major role, though not exclusively, in making a people better, so to speak, or more moral. The proof of this exists around us today, by the fact that governments with strong law enforcement systems manage to keep order in their jurisdiction and continually erode any interest in violent behaviour, given the perpetual threat of force by the state. This is visible even in something as simple as disciplining children or school students, wherein the threat of some kind of negative consequence is normally sufficient to keep students in line and over time form a habit of civilized behavior. This can likewise apply to matters of regulating public religion, which will be addressed a bit later on. Now, Michael and others may completely disagree with Wolf's take on the role of the magistrate in public culture and religion. And so if they want to dispute that, they can be my guest. The problem is that the argument isn't even acknowledged, yet it must be if one is claiming to critique Christian nationalism, at least any intellectually meaningful conception thereof. So on this specific question, Michael has not given any compelling argument. In fact, I could mount a more rationally compelling argument as follows. Premise 1. Michael Jones is the soyjack. 
Premise 2. I am the Chad. Conclusion. Anabaptist political theory is cringe. Somewhat related to this is his really bizarre comment in his main video that touches on the issue of immigration. The main focus is on preserving a nation and its borders. The Christian nation must be protected at all costs, so we Christians can thrive within our borders. It becomes a mission to protect the land, not one where land and property can be surrendered if it means the gospel will spread to more hearts. <laughs> Yet another perfect example of unprincipled argumentation, since it leads to conclusions that I'm, I'm certain Michael himself would not support. Taken to its logical extent, this axiom of immigration policy would effectively mean no immigration policy, at least towards non-Christians. Anyone, no matter how violent or uncivilized they are, should be brought onto our shores and dropped in our towns if that at least adds one more number to our gospel outreach quota. Now, Michael is reasonable, and he at least claims to be practically minded when it comes to government structure and policy, so I'm very certain that he does support immigration restrictions of some kind, such as whether someone has a violent criminal record, or links to terrorists, or perhaps is demonstrably of an antisocial erratic behavior that would harm the community wherever he's put in. But his argument against Christian nationalist concerns with border control would delegitimize even those sensible controls on immigration because, once again, they are still more souls in need of Christ who can and has changed the hearts of the worst kinds of people imaginable. So I simply ask Michael, given your argument here, why should immigration policy and airport customs even exist anymore? Why not let this group of distinguished doctors and engineers set up shop in the heart of New York City? Once again, to make it supremely clear, I'm confident that Michael supports serious regulations on immigration. It is his argument, however, that contradicts any such notion, unless he is to make the qualification that we should not be concerned with tightly controlling borders beyond the necessary restrictions to keep our nation safe. But if he goes that route, this would simply beg the question as to what are the necessary restrictions on immigration for the health of our nation? the very issue in question, and so we are brought back to square one. All in all, Michael assumes a modern moral and political framework as a judge of Christian political theory. And we have seen that this is simply question begging, and also just false from a biblical perspective. With all that said, this issue is distinct from, but very close to Michael's other statements about enforcing one's values through state power. So we'll address that next. And often when Christians have political power, we become too comfortable. We have become blessed with powerful nations meant to be used as tools for the kingdom. But instead the nations become our idols and Christianity becomes the tool, something to be used to protect our borders and enforce our way of life. We want a Christian nation, not because we think it will help Jesus in the goal of evangelizing the world, but because we want to be rich, safe, and powerful within our own borders. To be as respectful as I can be here, this is silly. All state action enforces values in some manner. Even laws seemingly as intuitive as banning cold-blooded murder or theft presuppose a value framework which individuals could choose to deny just as they do any religion or ideology. Why shouldn't murder be li hang on a second, it already is. Why shouldn't theft be legal? Why must we enforce your values, Michael, upon society? That reasoning is obviously absurd, but Michael's argument here necessitates that. More than this, the role of the state throughout Holy Scripture, whether a godly or a pagan nation, includes the upholding of the civil honor and public worship of the patron deity or deities. The whole of the Torah is a divine law code given from God to Israel, and it was not some one-off exceptional system for the special people. Other foreign deities ruled their nations through law codes and divine representatives. Now, modernist Christians will often respond with some slogan like, but that was Israel, or the new covenant is different now, or on the rare occasion, try to present an extended argument that the new covenant is strictly a matter of spirit-led persuasion in the gospel with no obligation for the state to submit to Christ and thus no obligation for it to rule according to divinely revealed justice. 
The problem with this is, first, Romans 13, the state is the servant of God. And in what universe does that not entail that the state ought to follow the dictates of God with respect to justice and public order? That's just stupid. But, but second of all, and the more salient point and problem with this is that this modern worldview is, well, just that. It's modern. There is no precedent for this in the Near Eastern or Greco-Roman contexts of Holy Scripture, nor in the early church, and especially not in Scripture itself. Just as mentioned earlier with regards to the ancient Near East, Greco-Roman civilization likewise assumed the essential role that the divine played in state affairs and the state in the public honor and glory of the divine. Reading any secondary source and many primary sources will demonstrate this, but in any event, as just one undeniable example of such, Roman religion was a state affair, including offices managed by the state, such as the Collegium Pontificum, the Pontifical College, and the Pontifex Maximus, the Supreme Pontiff, whom together were responsible for much of the maintenance of Roman religion, including public sacrifices, as well as the maintenance of the wider Pax Deorum, or the Peace of the Gods, basically ensuring that Jupiter doesn't yeet a bolt of lightning through the Emperor's skull. The problem maintenance of religion was taken very seriously by the pagan Roman state, and I, again, I don't feel the need to cite many specific sources for this since any major primary or secondary scholarly sources will make this abundantly clear to students of history. But as one such example, we have this small piece of dialogue spoken by a certain Mykonos to Octavian on how he should rule the realm, contained in Book 52 of Cassius Dio's Roman History. If you desire to become in very truth immortal, act as I advise. And furthermore, do not only yourself worship the divine power everywhere and in every way in accordance with the traditions of our fathers, but compel all others to honour it. Those who attempt to distort our religion with strange rites you should abhor and punish, not merely for the sake of the gods, since if a man despises these, he will not pay honour to any other being, but because such men, by bringing in new divinities in the place of the old, persuade many to adopt foreign practices, from which spring up conspiracies, factions, and cabals, which are far from profitable to a monarchy. Do not, therefore, permit anybody to be an atheist or a sorcerer. Hmm. I mean... We likewise have the example of the Christianized Roman Empire, wherein the Christian Roman emperors assumed a central role in the regulation of the church itself without any second thought. This can be seen very clearly through what is called the Theodosian Code, which was a compilation of Roman imperial decretals from the time of Constantine the Great up to Theodosius II in the 5th century. They include pages and pages and pages of regulation on public religion, such as heavy restrictions and crackdowns on pagan rituals and sacrifices, as well as that of heretics. And contrary to what Jones claims, state force has successfully shifted public attitudes. One, again, look in the world around us, for better or worse, on many different issues. Um, but also, the state has shifted public attitudes on morals and even religion throughout history. And we know this both because of, again, those reasons mentioned earlier, but also because that's exactly what happened with Christianity. For example, the Christianization of Europe and the virtual extermination of paganism and heresies like Arianism were not the sole efforts of mere individuals preaching and rationally persuading millions of people but also of Christian rulers enforcing the norm of orthodox, lowercase o, Christianity. Not by interrogating the private consciences of every single citizen, that's a straw man of Christian nationalism, but simply by regulating or straight up banning heretical and pagan worship. For example, after the conclusion of the Council of Constantinople in 381, Theodosius moved to stamp out anti-Trinitarian leadership in Constantinople and abroad. It was through these imperial councils that the fundamental creeds of our faith were formulated, and it was by their enforcement through subsequent emperors that they became the norm across all of Christendom, rather than just one or multiple articulations kind of floating around there. I won't go into more detail on this just yet, as I'm working on a stream lecture for this very topic, so stay tuned for that. All in all, the idea of a secular state that respected absolute freedom of religion and freedom of speech, and would not prioritize the public honor of any particular gods, was a completely unknown concept in the ancient mind, 
And for good reason. Because it's stupid. Is Christian nationalism typically anti-Semitic? You know, I have seen a lot of correlations which have been kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I had the two Messianic Jews, that, that's the name of their channel, uh, on, on last week to talk about why the New Testament is an anti-Semitic. And it is a little terrifying to see a lot of anti-Semitism in the Christian nationalist movement. But what have you seen, Andrew? Yeah, so I can I can bring the uh, data to bear on this. We do see very strong correlations and associations between embracing Christian nationalism and various anti-Semitic tropes. And so um, that is definitely a connection. And, and there is uh, a very real connection between anti-Semitism and Christian nationalism. Ah, anti-Semitism, a eh? <laughs> very spicy, but... An important and, if anything, necessary issue to deal with with respect to Christian nationalism and the great online flame wars regarding it. To begin FBI, with... They found me. They found me. They found me! We will end by addressing Michael's scriptural citations. Up to this point, every argument he has forwarded has been quite bunk, but he could still turn this all around if he can cite a clear denial of Christian nationalism in Holy Scripture, the ultimate authority of our faith. So, come on Michael, let's hear it. Before Jesus started his mission, he had to deal with the enemy, the old defeated king of the world. Jesus declared at his baptism for all the powers of darkness to see that he was the Messiah. And then he went into the wilderness to begin the war. After 40 days of fasting, Satan first tempted Jesus to turn stones into bread. A simple temptation that seemed reasonable. Why should Jesus not be sustained? After all, he is the Messiah and fasted long enough. He ought to use his power to satisfy his needs. None of us would think it unreasonable if a starving man was given the power to turn rocks into bread and then acted upon his new abilities. It was the will of the Father that Jesus rely on God's word and not act on his own for self-gratification, regardless of the suffering he experienced. You see, Jesus never called us to do anything he did not already experience. Satan then took him to the top of the temple and said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. Jesus, of course, resisted the temptation. But there is more going on besides testing God's care. This is another temptation of power. The third temptation is similar to the second. But instead, Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world. If the Jewish nation was not enough, Jesus could have it all, as long as he agreed to worship the devil. This is what Satan offered Jesus. Take the political and cultural road to growing your kingdom. Seize the nations, and with that power, you can make Christianity supreme. But our Lord set an example for us by rejecting this. And if we want to transform the world for his glory, we must also. Uh, um, 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 um. What? What was that? What What was the argument here? So, okay, okay, so... Christ came to suffer and die for our sins. Agreed. Satan tempted him with immediate temporal power over the earth, but Christ refused because that was not his mission on the earth. Agreed, again. Finally, he commissioned the disciples to convert the nations through the preaching of the gospel. And once again, agreed. Therefore, we cannot recognize and seek to preserve our own national peoples, nor take hold of the state and have it rule according to God's standards of justice and with a public preference for the Christian religion because gospel, because Jesus. We once again see a core methodological problem that has appeared throughout Michael Jones' arguments as noted in this video, and it does not spare his biblical arguments. He 
doesn't establish clear definitions and he doesn't argue according to clear hermeneutical principles and he doesn't provide a consistent set of premises from which to derive a conclusion. Instead, we are told a story from the Gospels and hear some vague principles which are seemingly intended to create some sort of vibe yeah. against Christian nationalism. I don't think Jones intended to argue for a mere vibe, yeah. but that is effectively what this comes across as. For an effective argument, he should have demonstrated how the story of Christ's temptation by Satan establishes or demonstrates principles which by their nature deny the propositions of Christian nationalism either directly or by good and necessary consequence. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen here. He likewise argues the following. But Jesus did not call us to protect the nation or land, but be willing to sell everything we have to follow him. We are called to count all we have earned as lost for the sake of Christ. Once again, we have some more Jesus duking. Where is the opposition between affirming a default natural good in the protection of one's land and people and a willingness to sacrifice everything for the sake of the gospel? Yet again, Michael puts two propositions at odds which are not at all in conflict but address different questions, or at least different scenarios. Yes, when the need arises, we as believers must be willing to drop everything for the gospel. I do not know any Christian nationalists, and I know many who denies this. Simultaneously, all else being equal, we are to operate as members of families, towns, and nations, and show preferential natural love to those who are our own family and kin since this is the social order which God has ordained for man. These propositions are not in conflict, and whether or not you define kin as purely blood relations or purely cultural associations or a combination of both, as I personally hold, the same holds. Take note as well, Michael likely does not apply this to how he runs his own family, for which he, as a father, has a special devotion and obligation to over and above the women and children of other families, which is not the same thing as showing no love or care to them. The question is on relative degrees of love, not to mention what kind of love. That Christ called us to hate our father and mother and followed him is not taken by Michael or other anti-Christian nationalists as signaling the sinfulness of wishing to protect and preserve one's family and show them special preference in your natural affairs over other families. So why can't this same both and reality be applied to whole nations, which are just as natural as the nuclear family? Finally, we have this interesting argument. Notice Jesus said all authority on heaven and earth had been given to him. He is now king of the whole world, and if he wanted, he could call down legions of angels to enforce his laws. But he doesn't. If Christian nationalism was the way forward for us, then why doesn't Jesus take this path? Why didn't he teach his followers to get a hold of positions in government and enforce his laws to foster an environment built on values he wants? Now, this is actually a very good question because it allows us to address the central reason for Christian nationalism. That answer is twofold. First, again, Christian nationalists happily acknowledge that Christ's mission on earth was not to directly and immediately establish Christian states, but to announce the kingdom of God, proclaim the gospel, and ultimately die a criminal's death for the sins of the whole world. The purpose of Christ's earthly ministry was not for him to be Paul Atreides kicking off the galactic jihad, and once again, this is freely admitted by Christian nationalists, because it's not even an admission, because it doesn't affect our thesis at all. But second, Christ actually does command the enforcing of his values over the nations, which I will now explain. Christian nationalism is grounded in the dual foundations of natural law and divine revelation. That is, that which we discern from the ordinary function and telos of nature, and that which we receive from divine revelation. Given that both of these sources are derived from the same ultimate authority, they can and do work together for the apprehension of truth. From this, Christian nationalists will discern that ethnically and or culturally homogenous nations are real and natural entities created by God. It's even tautological to speak of ethnically or culturally homogenous nations, 
since those qualities are essential to what constitutes a nation in the first place. And, and since these nations are real entities, they have a natural right and duty of self-preservation, just as an individual has a natural right and duty of self-preservation. They will also look at the state, they being Christian nationalists, and discern that it is an essential part of the nation and further discern that its fundamental purpose is the direction of the national will towards the survival of the nation and towards the good itself, to put it very simply. Again, read Dr. Wolf's Case for Christian Nationalism for more details. And even just read primary sources from the classical reform, reform scholastics, and so on. Um, then it will be discerned that Holy Scripture itself not only supports but assumes these natural facts of nations and the state, on top of providing revelational content on Christ's commission for the church to disciple all the nations. That is, not merely make individual disciples within the nations, sorry Baptists, but make the nations themselves as real collective entities into disciples. From this, it is a simple logical deduction that the Great Commission entails the conversion of whole nations, including their governments, towards Christ, which entails the state ruling according to the will of Christ and not with an equal concern for all religions, which presupposes a modern philosophy of state atheism unknown to the authors of Holy Scripture or any of the nations around them. This, in summary form, is how Christ's Great Commission actually commands Christian nationalism. To wrap up this video, I'll give one more summary analysis of what is wrong with almost all major attacks on the idea of Christian nationalism, including Michael Jones's. In appearance, they claim to represent the simple and clear teaching of Holy Scripture and the example of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, in actual fact, however, their exegesis is selective, and the ultimate cause of such is that anti-Christian nationalist attacks almost always assume an ideological paradigm and political landscape that is not only unbiblical, but completely novel to human experience before the Enlightenment, and even for a while after it. And while I don't believe most opponents of Christian nationalism know or think this, their arguments are just another instance of Satan quoting Holy Scripture to further his own interests and slow down the advance of Christ's kingdom, which does take over all spheres of human activity. As disciples of the risen Lord and the rightful king over all the earth, we must resist this at every opportunity, especially when it infiltrates our own ranks. We must adhere to the utterly clear teaching of Holy Scripture, that Christ is not merely Lord of our hearts or of the church, but of every tribe, tongue, nation, king, and authority. Thank you all very much for watching. I hope this video was informative and helped you in learning how to frame this issue with the depth of thought that it requires. If you haven't done so already, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Starting from this video onwards, I will be uploading a minimum of one new video per fortnight on top of any streams I happen to schedule throughout that time. If you want to help me continually raise the quality of these videos, both visually and intellectually, please consider going to my Locals page in the description below and become a supporter. You can join the Locals community for free first and see the pinned post that denotes what different tiers of support will get you. And there are many great benefits available, from voting rights for the next video to exclusive access to regular posts on the Locals drawn from my personal study notes, among many other things. So once again, thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a lovely day or evening. God bless.